Hello, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Here to walk through draft 1.2. This is the proposed uh, language that addresses highway safety for um, the tax and regulate bill, S54. So looks a little different than a regular amendment because it's just these sections of law plopped into a document um, and doesn't have some of the other language you're used to seeing. Right, and government operations has asked for recommendations. They haven't asked us for a particular form of amendment or that's a pretty open in terms of how we get back to them on, on our recommendations. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, some of this, some of these sections are going to look familiar to you. Um, some of it is similar to the first amendment that you looked at last week. Um, some of the changes to the DUI statutes, and then there's other language that's new. Um, but I'll just go through all of it to make it clear. So section one, um, this amends um, the basic training requirements statute in Title 20 to make A-RIDE, um, the Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement Training, um, a requirement for all law enforcement as a part of basic training. And it gives the training council until the end of 2020 to ensure that all officers uh, complete this A-RIDE training. And Bert, is it required for anybody at this point? So, um, it's not a requirement for law enforcement officers at level, I believe at any level, one, two, or three. Um, my understanding is that state police typically have this training, but it's not a requirement for standard law enforcement officers. So some, somebody in uh, standard law enforcement would call in potentially the state police or another officer that's A-RIDE certified? If they wanted a person who was certified to come and give a field sobriety test, yes. Right. So from there, if, if uh, the A-RIDE uh, officer determined that there's an issue, then he would in turn call. I believe that that is typically how it happens. I'm not. Um, I'm not going to testify Where's that that's how it always happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll move on to section two. We're getting into Title 23 now, into the DUI subchapter. Um, so this is the definitions section of law, and it adds um, saliva test to the definition of what an evidentiary test can be. Section 3 is the DUI statute. Um, the changes to the statute are primarily technical in nature. We went through them last time. Um, you'll see some language on page 2 is struck through. That's um, just been moved to a different subsection. So these are um, not substantive changes until you get to page 3. There's a new subdivision, um, subdivision I. And this provides that um, field Before we go past it, um, in section 3, um, so, if I get pulled over, um, I'm very adamant about that. I've, I've done nothing as far as sub substances go. I'm not under the influence of anything, and I refuse. Um, I could be charged. I'm going to assume I can be charged with the uh, enhanced penalty of 0.16 at that point. But, um Let's, will you show me where you are? Oh, and, and uh, yeah, uh, 1201, section three, right at the beginning. That's line 16, it starts on page one. Right, so, oh, so, no, this is, yeah, so, um, there's, so this is a long statute. It sets out several, several requirements under the DUI. Uh, statute, so it provides you can't um, operate under the influence. It also provides some enhanced penalties for operating with a high blood alcohol concentration, and it also provides for um, some instances where a person can be charged with a criminal pen uh, for criminal refusal. Right. So, and I don't know if the whole statute is here, so I'm not going to kind of continue if if I refuse because I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's over the top to uh, 
take any kind of samples from me. And it happens, I, I know this is all hypothetical, and it probably would never happen, but things can happen. Um, and say I'm at that point, I guess I would uh, on some level be detained or arrested, brought back to the, uh, the barracks, and possibly at that point a warrant for a blood test or a warrant for if, if we happen to pass saliva that is issued. And they get their uh, they get their information from the saliva or the blood, and it proves that I. Uh, I am not under the influence of anything, can I still be charged with uh, refusal? So what can happen if there is, um, if you initially refuse um, and an officer gets a warrant to take an evidentiary sample of your blood or saliva, um, the evidence of that refusal can be introduced at trial, um, but there is not a provision that, that um, you can be criminally penalized for refusing the test. So the evidence of your refusal can be introduced at trial to show, um, to demonstrate, to maybe demonstrate that you were impaired or that you were lying about your impairment or something. Um, but there's the process, the criminal penalty for refusal applies in other circumstances, and I'm just trying to pull up the statute to find out what those are. I think that it's if you've, um, if you're, if you have a DUI on your record, and I think that there's a criminal penalty if you refuse when you already have a DUI on your record, but I can confirm that. I just have to get the full statute in front of me. Okay, oh, that's, that's good. Okay. So, <clears throat> moving on to page three. The um, subdivision I provides that field sobriety tests that are done by an A-RIDE trained law enforcement officer and um, DRE evaluations are admissible um, at trial to demonstrate whether a person was operating in violation of the DUI statute. Can I interject there? So the way this is constructed, does that suggest that they're equivalent, whether you're deemed by someone trained in a ride or by a certified DRE? Both it, just, both, it just provides that they're both admissible and they can be considered by a... Right. In that... Um, I mean, that's is that a contradiction or a codification of that current? That is a codification of what is currently happening. Okay. So section four, this is the consent statute. So this is, um, I think it's much of this you have seen already. We've added saliva throughout. Um, so, to, so in the first place you see it is in the blood test provision on the bottom of page three. Um, this provides that if a person doesn't give a sufficient sample of breath or saliva, then um, a law enforcement officer can take an evidentiary sample of blood. And then the next page, page four, subdivision three, um, this is language that provides that a saliva test is available to law enforcement as an evidentiary test. And it treats saliva the same way that it treats blood. So much of this language is very similar um, to the language you see in subdivision two. Um, it provides that a person, um, it gives them, it, it provides for implied consent for saliva, but it also subjects it to the warrant requirement in the same way that we do for blood testing. So actually, if you, maybe help with me to go line by line. Sure. So we're on page four, subsection three. So it provides that if law enforcement has reasonable grounds to believe that the person's operating under the influ influence of a drug other than alcohol or under the combined influence of a drug and alcohol, then the person is deemed to have given their consent to the taking of an evidentiary sample of saliva. And any saliva test sought pursuant to this section has to be obtained pursuant to subsection F of this section of law, which is the warrant requirement section. And that is the same language you see in the previous subdivision regarding evidentiary blood tests. So, so that second sentence essentially is if they don't consent, you have to seek a warrant. That's right. That's essentially what they mean. That's right. Okay. Um, and then there's a, some additional language there that provides that any saliva test that it's, that's administered pursuant to this section can only be used to detect the presence of a drug and shall not be used to extract DNA information. That's the motion. 
That's correct. That language is also. <coughs> okay. Thank you. So, is it clear where this is that we're not talking about a roadside test here? Well, yes, because we're talking about evidentiary tests only, so it doesn't it doesn't um, encompass preliminary screens, which are the screens that are typically done roadside. Um, yes, and that aren't admissible. And again, it's we're adding saliva throughout the statute, <clears throat> so you'll see it again on page five that a refusal to take a breath or a saliva test may be introduced as evidence in a criminal proceeding, and that's what we talked about a moment ago. So the next change is in subdivision F. This is the warrant requirement section. If you turn to page six, we add a new subdivision under the warrant requirement that provides that if an evidentiary, I apologize. that's okay. Thanks. Uh, backing up. Sure. So is there any consequence if there's a refusal to take a blood test? Again, a refusal to take a, to take, um, that's, just saliva. that's right. Say no on that. That's right. So um, there was a recent Vermont Supreme Court case that said that um, admission of a refusal to submit to a blood test uh, in a DUI proceeding doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. So um, although it's not explicitly provided for in statute, there is precedent, um, there is precedent that it can be introduced um, in, as evidence in a criminal proceeding. Should, should we codify that in the deed? I don't know. Should well, you? <laughs> well, I mean, let me, let me ask it this way. If we put that in B, would that be codifying what the court has said? It would be codifying what the court provides is not unconstitutional. Um, Okay. Okay. I'm on page six. So this is that right. That second, it provides a subdivision to the warrant requirement. Subdivision two, that provides if an evidentiary test is sought, then a law enforcement officer can apply for a search warrant pursuant to Rule 41 to obtain that evidentiary sample. So again, it mirrors the language in um, the rest of subsection F regarding blood test, the requirement for a warrant for a blood test. I'll move on to section five, if that's all right. So um, this, again, is going to look familiar. Section 1203, the administration of tests. Um, subdivision A provides that a person who administers a saliva test must be certified by um, the Criminal Justice Training Council. Subsection B, this is language that comes from the T-bill. Um, so it adds EMTs and paramedics to the list of professionals that are authorized to take uh, a blood sample. And then there's some language in yellow you'll see on the bottom of page six to page seven. This is different from the language that came from the T-bill. And it provides that any... Sorry, just to take a step back. <coughs> um, uh, been certified by the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council to operate the breath of saliva testing equipment. Is that, um, do you have to have an uh, the A ride certified to do that, or is A ride uh, over and above uh, a certification? I believe that it's in addition. I will let somebody in the room correct me if I'm wrong about addition. that. Yes. Um, so the language in yellow just provides that any blood withdrawal shall not be done should not be taken at roadside, and that those limitations on who can conduct a, a, a blood test um, and you can't do it at roadside don't apply to the taking of a breath or a saliva sample. So I'm just kind of um, ha I'm, uh, having a hard time reading that and fully comprehending it. So it. Um, I mean, the, I understand, it's, so it's saying um, the limitation that the limitations. who can perform it yep. um, doesn't apply to breath or saliva, but we, are we also saying... Um, the We're also saying that that second sentence, the limitation that the blood can't be taken roadside, also doesn't apply to the taking of a saliva sample. 
So the idea is that a cheek swab that's sent to the lab c could potentially be done at Rhodes, an evidentiary test if, if, a, if, an, yeah. if an officer ha is, if there's a refusal and the officer has a warrant, that that test, there's not a restriction on that test that it can't be done roadside. However, it, the, it still has to be an evidentiary sample subject to the warrant requirement. So this breath and saliva roadside, uh, they're both consensual. Right or, right, or subject to a warrant for the saliva sample. Don't have a warrant requirement for a breath. Does that make it evidentiary if it's approved the warrant? I don't remember. So the, so, the stat, so the way the amendment is set up, it provides that only, um, only a saliva test can only be an evidentiary test, can't be a preliminary screen. There are preliminary breath tests that are done roadside. So it doesn't. Say that again. So uh, saliva tests are evidentiary. So that's what this amendment sets up. It sets up a provision that saliva testing can be done only as evidentiary tests, subject to the warrant requirement, similar to the way blood tests are are done currently in statute. I have a question for you. So, under this, if somebody is brought back to the police department and they say don't waste your time on a warrant, I will voluntarily give you a saliva sample. The officer still has to say, I, I'll ha I'm going to have to write a warrant anyways. Is that? No, you can, they, uh, they could take a saliva test if the person consents to that test. For, for the evidentiary one. For the evidentiary right. test, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there may, may or may not need to be some more clear, clarity here that what we're talking about here is is the what Dr. Conti uh, testified to last week, where uh, they take a swab, it goes into this special container, it's, it's uh, uh, labeled and such, and it's sent off to a lab. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's at the lab that they use the same equipment that they use for blood tests to find out what's in, the, in that fluid, that we're absolutely not talking about the, the equipment like the Draeger that we, we saw the other week. And, and, there may be a little ambiguity about that here. Uh, and, and I'd also suggest that we make it clear that this is not something that happens on the road side. The idea is that the, the bios and the swabs and all those things are maintained at the station and, and it's more of a controlled environment and not alongside the road and you can do it there. So I'm not sure what language that, but I think, unless it's clear to everybody else, it's not as clear to me as, as I'd like to see. Okay, so is the idea that any c saliva collection, <laughs> saliva sample collection, not occur roadside? I think, I think that's kind of what the idea was from what I was hearing from Dr. Conte. Okay. What about a consensual roadside? Well, I guess, you know, maybe you hear from law enforcement, because it's not the simple <coughs> machine that they that they use right now that it's all set up. It's, it's a separate, it's, I don't know if I'd even call it equipment. It's a swab and it's the container that it's placed in before it's sent off. I'm, I'm just thinking if, if there was a consensual, potentially, that yeah. somebody who doesn't want to be detained, potentially, could be swabbed and be on their way. But, but I, I realize it. The swab, the results of the swab, they'll come back from some kind of sent to the lab. I mean, it's not like any kind of immediate, that's, that's oh, the thing, it's not right. any kind of immediate detection. Uh, oh, because right. okay. those roadside tests are not as accurate as if you send it to the lab uh, where they screen no, the expensive but, equipment. Right, but it can be possibly determined if there's a substance system, right? Not, from the, not immediate. Uh, that, that's, that's so, a, I guess I'm confused. What, what are the five thousand dollar units? That, that's that's not included. In that. That's right. not included in here at all. That, well, there's a provision we'll see as far as a trigger for that, but that's a little bit later. Um, okay. I'm not sure we're confused on that. It, it's just if law enforcement says that it's it's not a problem to be able to do the swab roadside. But I just don't see a, a reason for that. It needs, it's not going to give them anything right then. It's going to be right, something right, that has right, to be right. sent off to the lab anyway. So yeah, keep it yeah. up until the fire, but keep it very clear and straight. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about two separate tests. One using the little machine that can tell you something to some percent accuracy roadside versus 
the, the much more reliable test than the Senate What are you basing that on? Uh, Dr. Conti's testimony that she gave us last week. And what was she basing that on? Again. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, she talked about a study that did a correlation between it was some number of individuals who had both blood draw and saliva draw and it correlated to 97.1%. Uh, she sent me a follow-up email that I'll forward to you. That would be great. Sure she talked about the, uh, the numbers there. That was great testimony. Anyway, so we may need some clarity. Understood. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll move on to subsection C. We're on page seven. So again, this is going to look familiar. These are the some cleanup changes that are done to the statute and also adds saliva to the independent analysis provision in the statute. So it provides that a person must give a sufficient sample of blood or saliva to enable independent analysis. And again, in subsection D on page eight, um, these are some both some cleanup changes and also provides that the analysis of a breath, saliva, or blood test has to be performed in accordance with DPS rule and failure to provide a sufficient saliva sample constitutes a refusal, breath or saliva sample. Um, if you look on page nine, subdivision H, this provides that tests that are taken out of state are admissible and it adds saliva tests to that portion. Right. That's a good point. Can I chime in, Kimberly, for, for that? There, there are multiple points in this process where the person is asked, the defendant is asked <clears throat> if they have any medical issues. And that at that point, that's typically when you would document something, something like that. If they, you know, if they actually do have a medical issue that would prohibit them from um, providing a sample of saliva. And that's all information that the state's attorney's office will take into consideration when they're compiling all the evidence in their case, when I think that's something that Pepper would be able to speak more on. But yeah, just to let you know that. I appreciate that. So I think the remaining changes to that section are just um, clerical changes. If you turn to page 10, section six, um, this is the section that just provides that arrangements for an independent chemical test. Um, have to be made by the person who's submitting the test, and it includes saliva to that statute. Section seven is the permissive inference statute that provides that um, if the state proves that um, if the defendant's blood alcohol concentration at the time of operation met a certain threshold, then a jury can draw an, an inference that he or she was under the influence. Um, and there's a technical change there. So in subsection B, it provides that um, the permissive inference statute shouldn't be construed to limit the introduction of any other competent evidence bearing on the question of whether the person was under the influence of alcohol or under the combined influence of alcohol or any other drug. So it just adds um, drugged driving to that portion of the statute. Um, section eight, so these are some the two new sections that you haven't seen yet. Um, this is a directive to the Department of Public Safety to report to the committees, standing committees on judiciary and government operations <clears throat> on or before January 15th of 2020, next year, on a plan to achieve geographic equity and DRE availability to conduct roadside evaluations um, of drivers who are suspected of violating the DUI statute across the state and also on their plan to expand the availability of the DRE program to um, uh, beyond law enforcement officers to other public safety officials to the extent that that is authorized by 
the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the National Tra Highway Traffic Safety Administration, um, which are sort of the governing bodies um, over the DRE program. Okay. So, uh, can you review with us right now who is qualified to be a DRE? Right now, it is law enforcement officers. So according to the credentialing body, which is the um, International Association of the Chiefs of Police, currently, um, in order to be a certified DRE um, person who can do the DRE evaluation, you have to either be a law enforcement officer employed by a law enforcement agency or another person who's employed by a law enforcement agency. Um, so. The majority of individuals who are DREs are law enforcement officers, but it um, appears, according to the credentialing agency's rules, that there may be some opportunity to provide uh, DRE training to other people who are not law enforcement officers. So again, the, the language is employees of the law enforcement Right, agency. yep. So that potentially could really open up the floor, um, especially where it's Especially where they're concerned about geographic consistency or availability. Well, I was just nodding in agreement. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I know the answer to the other uh, public safety officials. I guess, no, it wouldn't even be that. It would be uh, law enforcement officers. Does that include the game wardens? Because years ago we gave game wardens expanded. I believe it does include them, but I will confirm that and get back to you. Um. Okay, so the last section, section nine. This um, is a directive to the Department of Public Safety to issue a report um, contingent upon the National Traffic Highway Safety Association doing two things, identifying a threshold level of THC concentration in a person's bloodstream to establish impairment, and also approving a chemical testing device for um, roadside use that's capable of establishing such a threshold level of THC in a person's system. So upon NHTSA um, doing two, those two things, that triggers uh, the report requirement from DPS to report to the standing committees on a proposal to implement the use of such a device to evaluate individuals who are suspected of operating in violation of the DUI statute under the influence of marijuana. Again, this is for itself. Right. right, yes. So, I think what would be helpful would be a review of roadside preliminary tests um, versus evidentiary. We're, we're talking about both of them. Right. In this specific report requirement? Um, you know, I mean, just now, if you could with the committee, if you could. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure there are others that could also do this, but. Um, so. I have a few questions about the bill, but I was going to ask something about that particular section. So should I? So, so I'm I'm confused about what the intent is of this last part. If the the commissioner shall consider relevant standards in adopting such rules, but NHTSA has said um, very recently to Congress um, that. There currently is no test that is accurate, reliable, sensitive, and specific enough to use. Um, and that the presence of THC in blood, oral fluid, et cetera, does not establish impairment. It also doesn't distinguish between active use of marijuana and environmental exposure or contamination. Some studies have shown that people exposed to secondhand marijuana smoke can test positive for THC. And that second one is in a NHTSA report um, as well. And then the Governor's Highway Safety <coughs> Administration very, very specifically says in their 2017 report, the currently available devices are not yet, they're talking about oral saliva testing. 
So the currently available devices are not yet of evidentiary quality. The GAO in 2015 concluded that currently there is no validated roadside drug testing device. Um, they reviewed four studies of oral fluid devices for marijuana and concluded that while promising current devices have not yet achieved acceptable levels of sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Um, so, 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 so your, I'm yes, confused. So was, what's, what's the intent, and, I, um, and Bryn, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you look at the language, it says upon. I, yeah, I'm wondering if, I think that you might be looking at the requirement that the commissioner adopt rules um, relating to the operation or maintenance of preliminary alcohol screening devices. So that's an existing requirement, and it doesn't apply to any saliva testing devices okay. that would be used for evidentiary testing. It's just for preliminary alcohol screening devices. And then, but up in the beginning, we definitely are in B on page... Well, in B on page five, we're saying saliva tests may be introduced as evidence. And then we're saying on page one, evidentiary test means saliva. So it does seem like we're saying something that's counter to what NHTSA is saying in the Governor's Safety, Highway Safety Association. So that would be concerning. Again, that's what I was trying to get to before. And what we heard from Dr. Tuggy, I did send you this information additional information, I also have it posted now uh, from Dr. Conti, that it's the roadside test, that the that device that is not accurate. It's it's the oral fluid test that you send back to the lab and run through the same equipment as you do blood. I know it doesn't tell you Kermit, but it tells you the same that blood would tell you. And is it the Drager or is it one of no, those? No, it's not those. It's a completely different... So, just again, I'll look at the notation, but um, it's still pretty rare that s states are using that in either type of um, oral fluid as evidentiary. Um, what, what the Governor's Highway Safety Association says is that blood is the gold standard after the DRE um, work as a confirming document. So. I guess I'd want to know why we'd be going against that based on Dr. Conte. Uh, well, it's, uh, I guess, a couple things, if, if, I, if I may. Um, that <clears throat> the, the test that she uh, was referring to, which had 326 drivers that had both oral fluid and blood samples collected, uh, found that there was a 97.2% correlation rate where they both found the presence of, of the drugs. There were some that they didn't, one or the other, because there's certain drugs I guess you cannot find in oral fluid. Uh -huh. uh, and the same might be uh, actually with blood. Uh, THC is not one of those, you can find it in both. Um, and that's, it's a less, I mean, if, if there's a couple of reasons why it could be a benefit. It could be a benefit to the defendant or the person going in. Right. And it could be a benefit, uh, benefit certainly to law enforcement. Uh, for one, if the person consents, uh, that saliva swab is much closer to the time where the person is pulled over. So the metabolizing of whatever might be in the person's system, you're catching it closer to that time and it may not have metabolized. It's a benefit to uh, the individual because it's a lot less intrusive than a blood draw. Uh, so I mean, there's a pluses on both sides. And, the, the, and it's it pursuant to a warrant. It has to be per pursuant to a warrant, either blood or the saliva uh, test. Uh, although there can be the consent. I mean, there are obviously. Uh, so so that's that's why I suggested putting it in there. It does, it does uh, provide another avenue for identifying the presence of THC or other substances. So, an, a report, another report by the Reason Foundation, which um, said that devices, basically that it's very difficult to take levels of THC and convert them to the co THC concentrations to blood concentrations and that it's hard to um, tell from, again, saliva if 
it was orally ingested, it, it's very limiting, I guess. So I'm wondering, again, you mentioned it being less intrusive, but we know that saliva is going to test for seven different types of drugs that people take, such as anti So, Susan Barber, so I just want to make sure which section of the I am talking about where we're asking people. Um, we started asking about section nine, and I right. Okay. And and that there's trigger language in there, and that's not really access to it. Okay. So so one thing I think that's important from the saliva test because I am not sure if the blood test is testing for seven different drugs. That would be good to know. Or for either test, how is that information shared? Because again, we heard it could be people driving to their methadone appointment. It could be people on antidepressants, on anti-anxiety medicine. Um, also, it could be people on ADHD medication. And a lot of that seems like it is information that could further be um, embarrassing to people that they're not impaired, but people have information on their on their medical conditions, which I worry about and wasn't sure who could tell us if it's like if there's any ADA violations with having that information be public. Dr. Conti did say, I asked if that was shared publicly, and she said. I mean, there's no law keeping it from being shared publicly in an arrest report. So I'm worried about that. So, so that may be a perfectly legitimate worry, but what, I'm, what I've tried to do with this and work with Brandon and others to try to do with this is the saliva test is the same as the blood test, essentially. And it doesn't do anything more or less than the blood test, except that it can be earlier in time and it can be less intrusive. <coughs> to the extent that those concerns that you have I would assume that those go to the results of the blood test uh, as well. I don't know the answer to what your concern is, but but it's that that's not the question of whether to do saliva. It's whether to do either of them, frankly, blood or saliva. It's it just seems interesting because so many states are only using saliva as a pilot. So I'm not sure. And actually, there are lawsuits now in Canada and Australia. So I don't know why we want to be. Again, let's see test. the, you know, let's see the research. Why aren't other states using it? Um, so, so actually, we're, we're okay, right so we're okay. okay. Yeah. Um, just want to make sure people people understand. So I can talk a little bit about the difference between a preliminary tests and yeah. an evidentiary test. And again, what what is section nine going to? Which so this specifically talks about NHTSA approving a device that's capable of testing at the roadside. So that presumably would be a preliminary test. So that's key. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, pre it presumably it would be a preliminary test if it's capable of providing this information at the roadside. So it wouldn't have to be a sample that was collected and sent to the state lab, but rather it would be some equipment that could be used roadside. Uh, at the point just to make, we're on section nine with uh, section nine, right? Yep. The, I think it might be wise to incorporate um, language in which <coughs> if future psychoactive metabolites are discovered, that should be taken into consideration because we don't know where the science will be in five or 10 years. And if a new metabolite is discovered in cannabis that is much more indicative of present impairment as compared to Delta 9, I think that might be good language to add, if, if you folks agree. Because again, this is a pun. Yeah. Right, so the report isn't triggered until these findings are made. So I'll talk a little bit about the preliminary test versus the evidentiary test. Um, so. When law enforcement has reason to believe that a person is violating the DUI statute, the officer can request that the person um, provide a preliminary screening test, a pre preliminary breath test. Um, so at this stage, there's not a right to consult with counsel, and the results of that preliminary test cannot be used by law, 
they can't be ad admitted at trial to show impairment, but they can be used to for, by law enforcement to determine whether or not to arrest a person or to ask for an evidentiary test. So the evidence. Yes and no. Well, no. So yeah, no. So probably been said a hundred times already. An approved saliva testing device. If, if it happened to be a roadside testing device, that would give some information. I, I know it can't give levels of impairment. That's, that's pretty clear. But the roadside could give uh, an indication that somebody had something in their system. That is the testimony that you've heard about those devices, like yes. Okay. So the evidentiary test, um, we we have a provision in our statute that that provides for implied consent to an evidentiary test um, when a law enforcement officer has reasonable grounds to believe that the person was operating in violation of the DUI statute. So at that point. Um, the person has the right to consult with an attorney before deciding whether to submit to that evidentiary test. And the evidentiary test is admissible at trial to um, go towards the question of whether or not the person was impaired. So preliminary test, not admissible at trial, evidentiary test is admissible. Right. Why is that? Why is the roadside test not? With the preliminary screen? Yeah, preliminary screen, not. So at the preliminary stage, um, the, it's sort of an information gathering. I think what you've heard from law enforcement is that this is really an information gathering stage. And that evidence can be used to um, provide sufficient probable cause to arrest the person or to ask for an evidentiary test, which they may have to apply for a warrant mm -hmm. to get if they're seeking a blood test. So they have to have reason to believe the person's operating in violation, but they don't have to have probable cause at that point to request a preliminary test. Does it also have to do with the controlled environment, roadside versus in the barracks or station? For some reason I thought I heard that before. Maybe. That's it, I maybe. Can I chime in? A part of this also has to do with how recent someone has drank, because if you take a shot and then get right behind the wheel and then you get pulled over five minutes later, your preliminary breath test is going to be substantially different than 45 minutes later when you're at the point in processing where you're delivering an evidentiary sample because of the residual alcohol that's remaining on your breath or and in your saliva. Um, the other thing also has to do with observing a person for 15 minutes because and also making sure that they don't have anything in their mouth because certain types of gum, uh, chewing tobacco, can actually mess with the evidentiary sample result or the, or the preliminary breath result substantially. And so during the processing, right before you take your evidentiary sample, you have somebody under observation. You're, they're not supposed to leave your site. You're making sure they're not burping or vomiting or anything like that. And you're also making sure they don't have anything in their mouth that could affect the breath sample. So um, I think that's a good question. I would be interested to hear other people's perspective on this. Um, I would say that I think if there's an implied consent provision, then um, that allows law enforcement to take an evidentiary sample if the person is unconscious. Um, and also, it, I think that it would allow for that refusal to be introduced as evidence in a criminal proceeding with the implied consent statute. I agree that it's, um, it's a little funny to say that you essentially have given your consent to an evidentiary test, but then also subject that to um, a warrant requirement if you refuse. 
So that's why I say I would be curious to hear what other people have to say about that. But my, I'm, I'm thinking that it would apply in both those contexts. If you're, if a person is unconscious, um, then the implied consent statute would give law enforcement the authority to take an evidentiary sample in that case. Although I know that there is a, um, I think oral argument was just heard uh, in front of the Supreme Court about this issue, about whether or not implied consent, um, an implied consent statute is constitutional under the Fourth Amendment for a person who is unconscious. So there may be more information coming about this from the Supreme Court. But the implied consent that already operates with the blood. It test. does. So now, would you have to get a warrant? For it does. It, right? Yep. <laughs> so the way that this is set up, it just applies those same requirements to an evidentiary saliva test as it does to a blood test. I mean, I'll, I'll start by saying that I think, um, you know, regarding the trigger language part of this, you know, everything, and if I'm wrong, Brigham, please correct me, but I mean, everything that comes from the DUI process is governed under NHTSA and the IACP. Um, I think it's important that any new tools that we're trying to put in the toolbox needs to be vetted by that standard. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that, I mean, look, it, I'll, I'll tell you this too, you know, what, what we've heard before is the idea, you know, of the officer on the side of the road, they're screening somebody for impairment and they think it might be drugs. And then they get to that point where they would otherwise be delivering a PBT to somebody who'd be, who had been drinking, but it's drugs. And wouldn't it be nice to have that saliva test? I, that's a sympathetic argument, and I get that. However, if you're providing that officer with a test that's not reliable, that's not approved by NHTSA, in my opinion, you're just actually making the situation worse. Because I, I've been in that scenario before where I've been at that point, and I'm wondering, you know, what, if only I had some sort of magical test that could tell me what drug this person is on. But then if I have that test, and I administer it and I'm uncertain of the results, that's only going to muddy the waters even further. And you know, I was reading about Michigan's last pilot project and you know, they, recommend, they did not recommend it for further use until there's more studies and they had 11, 11 out of 74 were false positives. Roadside. Roadside, yes. And, yes, yes. And, you know, I mean, who knows where the science will be in five or ten years if, I mean, we develop science rapidly and if we're able to find that new metabolite that is, that would be parallel to impairment, the same way that we can say, okay, a .08, if you're a .08 or above, you're getting arrested for DUI, even if you pass the field sobriety test. And if we can find some sort of equivalent through further study and research where we can say, okay, you're above a certain threshold for this metabolite, and based on extensive research and studies, we know that that is the per se limit, I'd be comfortable with that. But you know, currently, I don't think we should be incorporating roadside saliva uh, until those standards are met. And that's what Section 9 tends to get. Yes. Yeah. And also, can I talk about the A-Ride and DRE yeah, right. programs? So when we're thinking about A-Ride and DRE, also remember that their usefulness expands beyond just DUI enforcement. And it's often common for officers who have DRE training to go to these different cases that involve drugs, whether it's an overdose or a search warrant or a drug interdiction case. You know, oftentimes when my colleagues are, you know, 
pulling drugs out of cars, they'll have me go there to just, just an extra set of eyes from somebody who's had the training of a DRE because we tend to spot things related to drugs that most officers don't spot. And so I think when you look at the bigger picture of the uh, drug usage problem in Vermont, I think that increasing the training and trying to get more geographic equity in terms of where DREs are, I, I think that could have a pretty significant impact, not just on DUI enforcement, but also the greater at-large issues. In, in your view, I have to flip back through the language. Officers who are getting a ride, and I don't think it's a ride certified, it's certified, just a ride trained, does that, in your view, muddy the water? Because here are more individuals who haven't gone through as rigorous a training and who are asked to make those difficult judgment calls. And I'm assuming at the end of the DRE, to use the word certified, you had to take a test. I think I remember you telling us about Many that. Many tests. So yeah. if you go through an A-RIDE training, do you still have some judgment of capacity at the end of the training versus, yeah, I went to a training? So A-RIDE is a certificate, right? It's, it's not a certification. No. Uh, it's a training to say that there is not a, to be certified, you're right about the testing piece, ma'am. So it's, you, the correct testimony would be, I'm, I'm A-RIDE trained. It's a little misnomer to say I'm A-RIDE certified. Yeah. As far as language. No, no. That's yeah, I just wanted to verify that. It's been a long time since I've gone through A-RIDE. But the DRE, so uh, your question was, would it muddy the waters further if you're A-RIDE certified but not DRE certified? Um, I don't think so because yeah, you're, you're compressing a lot of the information, a lot of the basic information from the DRE training into a two-day course that gives officers at least a cursory understanding of what the seven drug categories will do to, or how they'll impair a person. And yeah, I mean, this is where officers who previously didn't know learn the difference between dilated and constricted pupils, for example. And that's, that's an important thing to know. And so it, it also provides you with two additional field sobriety tests that you can utilize. Um, and you know, so you go from three tests to having five tests, including the lack of convergence test, which is an important one when you're... Um, when you're taking into consideration cannabis impairment. Yeah. So, so for the breath test, is there special training that has to be taken or can any law enforcement administer the... You, you have to go through training. To, does everybody go through that training? Yes. Yeah, well, I, I guess technically you, you can, if your police department says, no, you're not going through that training, then you don't go through it. You're in the post-basic academy. And then you just can't administer the test to anybody, and so you have to call your friend to come and help you. So, but I don't think that happens often. So, and so with the A ride training, the bottom line is it would help the law enforcement officers to decide whether to bring that person to the station. And it's it's more knowledge. Really it makes you less uncertain, and it, it makes you aware of the bigger signs of impairment that you can use to differentiate. You know, it's, it's better to say to yourself, you know, based on my A-Ride training, I think this person might be on narcotic analgesics or heroin. But I'm going to call my DRE friend and tell him what I have and then take the process from there. That's a much better scenario than saying, I think this person's on drugs, but I have no idea what I'm doing here. So, so... So I've, I've heard the concern that uh, law enforcement officers who have not had particular training, maybe they're new law enforcement officers are out there, they pulled somebody over, they suspect just what he said, that this person has got drugs. I don't know much at all about it, but uh, but I have this test here I can use, uh, this breeder and whatnot, and I can test and see if the person has the drugs. So, there's that choice, or there's a choice, in my view, of, well, give them the A-Ride training. Instead of having to have this fallback of using an unreliable <coughs> instrument to see if the drugs are there, why not have somebody do the A-Ride training? 
I guess the question is, you, on balance, if you can compare having had that A ride training with having had having this uh, roadside saliva test. So what, what's your question? question? There. Did you see the question? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> and if you can compare the, I mean, the concept of a young law enforcement officer, yeah. a new law enforcement officer, I'd say, I'd say yeah, the, to best be able to police whether somebody is driving under the influence of drugs, a ride or or the saliva test. I I would go with a ride ten ten times out of ten because, I mean, when when you have this test in its current state as it's unreliable in my opinion based on the studies that i've read i think that would create further uncertainty because you know you have these clues in front of you you have this possibly impaired person you administer the saliva test and if you know that it's not approved by NHTSA and you know that it's quite possible you could have a false positive or a false negative you get that saliva result, now you're going to be second guessing yourself on the saliva result and saying, well, did I just get a positive because it's a false positive or is this person actually, does this person actually have drugs on board? And I think it will further muddy the waters. And regardless, you're still going to need a DRE anyways. And so instead, if you're A-Ride certified and you can say, based on what I'm seeing, based on my A-Ride training, I think this person has been smoking cannabis or they've been using dissociative anesthetics or whatever it is. And now I have to take it to the next step where I need a DRE. I'm going to make that phone call and call one up and get the ball rolling. And that's what this is being, one of the persons involved with, with this draft. That's what this draft intends to, to mm -hmm. reflect. Yeah. And I just also wanted to reemphasize, you know, a saliva test can't also help for all the other cases that an A-Ride officer or a DRE can help in, like those search warrants or those overdoses or um, you know, drug interdiction cases. So, you know, it's, and, and the other thing is that DREs are often consulted by other officers, just, you know, whether it's during dinner or lunch or whatever, just conversations about drugs because they are seen as experts and they have that information and so there's just always generally this continual education of other officers on the shift so I um, totally agree with you and again sort of the research backs that up so again this report looked at each of the methods and and basically said that um, NHTSA studies verify DRE evaluation accuracy rates where toxicology results confirm the drugs identified by the DRE officer were between 94 and 98 percent. Um, and again, it's saying establishing impairment through DRE evaluation corroborated by toxicological screening for marijuana is the most accurate means for detecting and assessing marijuana impaired drivers rather than simply marijuana positive drivers, which um, again, then it goes on to give the odds for each of the biological tests, putting blood higher than saliva for that confirming test. Um, even if it's 165 um, minutes later, which they were saying in some places, that's what the average is. Um, and again, saying, the concerns related to saliva. I cannot find a study that shows lab saliva being more accurate. I'm concerned that 300 and something is a really small study. Some of the other studies I've seen are like 30,000. Sorry, more accurate or as? I mean, more accurate, more accurate than, than roadside. So well, I, I can't find Dr. Conti's study. I saw the email, but I can't find what that goes to. Let me just confirm that the, the study you were talking about, was that talking about one of the roadside type of saliva tests? I mean, it's no, like, it's it was it, talking about what you could get from the fluids that it's, through the same machine. It's right? talking about what the evidence shows to a common sense approach to marijuana impaired driving. Then I looked at Oregon because Oregon's been um, at it for a while and 
that's basically what they're doing. So, again, states that have legalized marijuana for longer than we have are not necessarily going to saliva, and I'm sure they have labs as good as ours. I don't, I can't imagine, like, it just seems unusual to me that we have the statistic now that's being held out that's back to 2007 because nobody is saying, oh, the lab saliva tests are super accurate. They're saying you can't tell from saliva what, um, you know, based on how frequent people use, the method they use, you're not going to be able to tell a whole heck of a lot. And you can tell more from blood, which, again, doesn't seem like you can tell a lot from blood, but nobody is saying, but if you do it in the lab in Vermont, it's good. You know what I mean? So I'm just worried about this elusive study. I, I understand what you're saying on that. I mean, my, my biggest concern is whether the evidentiary saliva test was as accurate as the blood test. And the expert that we had in here testified that it is. Um, but I would say that the expert works for the administration. The administration is pushing this. And I would, in some ways, like to hear from people who are outside of Vermont who have had more experience with it. Do you think people should be given a choice or they want to opt for blood versus If they're fully told what the risks are about, you know, like if you asked you know, if somebody's like, would you rather ha us take your blood or your saliva? They might say saliva, but I think we'd have to disclose, but it could be a false positive, and NHTSA has not. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on NHTSA to come up with standards. And again, one of these other studies said, the great thing about um, DUIs is you can take the objectivity out, and there's, we know a number that does at least correspond to impairment, where there's just so much subjectivity going on here that these 12 tests that the DREs do definitely have more confirmation to impairment than almost anything else. And again, I'd certainly encourage, I made extra copies if anyone wants to see, and their recommendations are such that, um, here, we'll pop that down the other one. The same thing as the governor's highway safety folks have made similar recommendations. And I feel like we want to do what's safest for people and will not, I was appreciative that the blood test had a cap on it and was gonna say, we should add a cap on what the toe's gonna be because you know if somebody gets hauled into a lab, their car's going to get towed, and they're going to have a $500 towing and storage charge when it's over, and I'm sure we're not going to reimburse them if they test negative. You know, like, it's a huge, it's an ordeal, you know, and I don't want, I, do, I don't want to see innocent Vermonters get tangled up in it when, you know, we all wish there were a test that was reliable, but gosh, the DREs are the best thing going right now, and let's look at the evidence. You know, can I just want to look at, there was an interesting interview with a professor at Stanford who talked about the fact, and I'm getting to your preference for DREs, that somebody's roadside, and you know, the example given in the interview, I think, was if you're a 17 year old African American kid versus, you know, a 54 year old white guy, and one person would have maybe a different experience than another, and therefore there's more subjectivity with theory than we might all like to think. And I should be curious what either of you might think. Yeah, uh, I mean, bias and subjectivity is a very real thing in police. Um, it's, you know, we are trained to be as impartial and objective, to, to be as impartial and objective as possible for the DRE process and actually throughout everything that we do as cops. But um, that that is a valid concern because cops are humans and every human has implicit bias. So I mean that that's really 
like to the extent of, I mean, it, it can affect you, it, it may not affect you, but you're, you bring up a valid point. And suppose you're calculating, if someone says, uh, do a toe to toe for nine steps, turn around, and let's say you get to step seven or step eight, is there some running total with the DRE where you're making that qualitative judgment on the various steps you go through, and sometimes it's a close call, or you know, you have to lean back over, close your eyes, touch your, you know, any number of things, and we've talked about this a bit, and mm -hmm. about how those may be difficult yeah. for any number of reasons. There, yeah. But I assume those are all compensating for to some degree because this is not new. So there are parts of the DRE evaluation that are quantitative, but you're forming your opinion at the end of the entire evaluation where you're taking into consideration all of the evidence, as well as the, including the car stop and what was seen and um, uh, discussed on the roadside, and then you're forming your opinion. Um, but there are certain parts for uh, divided attention tests, for example, or you know measuring uh, pupil size, that there are quantitative parameters for those things. So uh, yes, and it, I mean it's a long list, and I can show you each part of it on the base sheet of the DRE eval after this if you'd like. And. I mean, so having a blood test after at least confirm it, it would it would either confirm what the DRE found or or not, but which is interesting rather than beforehand, which could because you were talking about when you were trained, like you were presented what the information after, and so in some ways it didn't it didn't um, bias you to look for something. Yeah. So. One thing I'll tell you is that we're, it, it doesn't always happen, but ideally you want to finish your report before you get the results back from the blood. And you're, you're giving your opinion. So, I mean, you, you get the blood sample sent, and right before that you're giving your opinion to the, op, uh, to the arresting officer as to what drug categories you think the driver is on. And ideally you're supposed to finish your report before that blood comes back the blood results come back so that you're not um, encountering any sort of confirmation bias or subjectivity. It is an example of the great circle of life, I guess, right? Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> if ever a bill were. So yeah, a couple of minutes of background. Hi, Eric Fitzpatrick uh, here this afternoon to talk about a uh, portion of S-112, which is an actor waiting to earn good time. And the, uh, the as a great title, and as, as was the section was called that as well. So couple of minutes of background. Good time generally means that uh, it refers to inmates within the Department of Corrections. And it means that through some sort of however you want to statutorily define it, through some sort of good behavior, it might be compliance with Department of Corrections rules and regulations, it might be just not getting any disciplinary charges against you, not being pulled back into uh, a, a, a facility after you've been out in the community, you can find however you want. But as, but the general picture means that it allows an offender who's been sentenced. So in other words, this is all post sentence, right? This isn't beforehand. This is after the person's been sentenced and is within the custody of DOC to obtain <coughs> reductions in their sentence. And that sentence, the reduction, is called a good time reduction because it's for you, you uh, uh, performing good time, engaging in good time. Your time served is good. You know, it's no violations, that sort of thing. And you um, are able, by behaving in that way, to get your sentence reduced. So that's the big picture concept. And the other interesting thing about it is that you know Vermont had a good time system for almost 40 years. Had, it was had for a long period of time. Had, in fact, had more than one. It changed over time, sort of different ways that it would be applied, different sort of conduct that the uh, inmate had to engage in in order to get good time. There were several changes to it made over the years. Uh, work camp got added to the work camp, folks. But in 2005. 
as part of the truth and sentencing, what's going on at the same time, there was truth and sentencing and there was the justice reinvestment, which you, know, you may have heard of now, like that has also come back. And the whole concept of it was to try and use corrections dollars more wisely, to uh, you know use the amount of bed space that you had more wisely, that sort of thing. And when that happened in 2005, the good time statute got repealed. So instead, that's when furlough got instituted. So they went from good time to furlough. And now they're talking about going back. And I guess after, what, almost 15 years, I suppose, right, of, of experience with that, there's been some uh, conclusion by people that sort of deal with this stuff every day. I'm not one of those folks. I don't have that level of expertise. But the people that do deal with it are saying that, um, that good time would be a good system to re-implement and and for and according to the commissioner, he said, I think if I'm remembering right, I think he said there were. I think he said over 20 different types of furlough, so that's become this complex, complicated system to administer, and that um, they're thinking about better, more efficient ways to deal with the sort of offenders who they want to be um, kept inside and allow others who uh, who should be able to be let out um, achieve that. Uh, that status outside of DOC. So, so is it getting rid of the furlough? Is that this, not in this bill, no. Okay. But what the, a separate part of the bill, which we can certainly run through the whole thing, but a separate part other than the good time piece um, is a study. And that study is to consider uh, an, implement, an implementation of a system called presumptive parole. And under uh, the way parole works now, and I, I really learned this this year myself, but uh, when, you know, in Vermont, sentences have a minimum and a maximum, right? Sentenced to three to six years, say, or five to ten years, whatever it may be. There's always a minimum and a maximum. When you reach your minimum, um, you have a right to go before the parole board and ask for parole. Any, any, when anybody hits their minimum, they can go try and get parole. Now, when that happens, the, the burden, so to speak, the evidentiary burden, is on the, uh, the inmate, the offender, to show that they have a right to parole, and the parole board makes the decision for each person. So presumptive parole, and uh, they'll have to decide, DOC, in the course of the study, the parole board's in on the study as well, um, to, uh, to consider how it's going to impact furlough. But the idea of presumptive parole is, once you hit your minimum, there's a presumption that you get out on parole. And the burden is no longer on the defendant, the offender, to show that they have a right to get out by parole. The burden is on the department to show that you shouldn't go out. So there's a presumption that every person who hits their minimum goes out on parole. And then you go before the parole board, and unless the, de unless the department can show that the person shouldn't be paroled, they go out. And that's, that's again, that's not a change in law in the S-112. It's for them to study whether or not that should be a system. And that, from what I understand from the commissioner, part of what they'd study would be like, you know, if they did something like that, maybe you're not going to need furlough so much. Um, at least not as many types as they have now. That's the idea. So that's a separate piece of the bill, uh, but also it's all part of this, it's all part of the same package. So as I mentioned, good time got repealed in 2005. This proposed, the bill, the language in here, um, in reinstitutes it, essentially. Now, it doesn't do it quite the same way, because what it does is it, it tasks the Department of Corrections with doing it by rule. So instead of putting every parameter, every element of this good time program in the statute, it says to the department, you come back with a rule, and it gives them a time. They wanted some time on this. So it's, I think it's July 1st, 2020. But by July 1st, 2020, they have to come to LCAR with a rule that reinstitutes a good time program. And the way it's going to work is you get five days off your minimum and five days off your maximum for every 30 days, for every 30 day um, window, for, for their day group period of time during which you've either not been charged with a major disciplinary offense. So that would apply if you think about it, to everybody who's incarcerated. Because only if you're incarcerated do you get, can you get disciplinary offenses. If you're out in the community, either on furlough or supervised release, they don't have DRs. So, uh, if you're incarcerated and you don't get a major disciplinary offense for your 30-day period, then you get five days off your minimum, five days off your maximum. If you're not incarcerated, if you're out on furlough or some community release program, the, what applies to that person is you have to not be uh, reintegrated, or not reintegrated, I the word that we use here, you do not have to be, um, 
reincarcerated from the community uh, for a violation of conditions. So as long as you're not, as long, if you're out there for that 30-day period of time, you don't get pulled back into uh, incarceration because you violated some of your conditions for being in the community. If that doesn't happen to you, then you get your five-day reduction too. Does that make sense? So that's that's the proposal of how it's going to work. Now, again, the 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 rule is going to be where some of the details are going to be, but these parameters of who it applies to are in the bill, are in the statute, and uh, and then DOC has got a year and a half essentially, right? Yeah, a year and a half, or actually, it's July 1st, 2020, so, yeah, actually two years, right? Roughly, two years to come back with the rule. Um, Eric, you said the crimes that it applies to are in the bill. Uh, yes, but it applies to all crimes, except for people who are sentenced to life without parole. Even the... Yep. Yep. It, was 12 mm -hmm. it is 12. <laughs> yep. It's the big 12. It does apply to, to everybody other than the life without parole. Yeah. Um, so, the issue that, uh, that House Corrections and Institutions wanted you guys to look at is a sort of a concept that's related to good time. It's not exactly the same thing. And it's, but it's a similar idea. And this is the idea of substance use disorder treatment and getting a reduction in, in your sentence for time that you spend in an inpatient substance use disorder treatment facility. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So um, as you can think, see that, although it's similar to good time because you're getting a reduction in your sentence for some behavior that you engage in, it's not exactly the same thing. And because it's a sentencing issue, it's a criminal sentencing issue. It's not an issue of what the what the commissioner can do to your sentence after you are if you've already been sentenced. Oh, that's okay. Because <laughs> good time, you've already been sentenced. The commissioner can reduce your sentence because of this behavior that you've engaged in um, uh, while you're under DOC supervision. There's a separate issue, which is uh, what if you've and you you know sometimes this happens. It's not unusual. The person, for example, gets uh, charged with DUI person um, can go into an inpatient substance use disorder treatment before they've even been, uh, their court case has even gone through before they've even been adjudicated. You can get time, you can get credit for that time that you've served in the inpatient facility. And my understanding from Judge Gerson is that as a matter of practice, that that happens currently anyway. So in a sense, this is just codifying what is already the case. Um, so, yeah. so there's no consideration for outpatient? I mean, there's some people that, you know, will, May continue to work and, and uh, um, you know be a good employee, and you know, in five nights a week they go to uh, outpatient. But that doesn't doesn't apply here. Only Not in here, patient. right? No, you certainly could. I mean, that's a policy choice for you guys, but this only deals with inpatient treatment. And I just had a, I have that question too. Um, is there any are we in this section on page four, um, section three? So we're really just using inpatient and residential treatment um, synonymously, right? Well, and the difference is what we're saying you can get a day off, but it doesn't, it's not eligible for the time. Well, this is interesting. So, uh, this piece that you're looking at now, uh -huh. that actually is, um, related to what the commissioner can do, and this is more closely connected to good time. So he thought about it as to who would have authority over this person, so it depends on uh, whether they get the treatment pre-adjudication, before the adjudication, or afterward. Mm -hmm. So right here, this subdivision that you're looking at, subdivision three, is post-adjudication. That's after the person has pled guilty or been found guilty or uh, something like that. Um, Whereas, if you look down, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here to uh, see. There's this. If you look at page six, and this this is the folks who get treatment pre adjudication, and this is in a, sen a section of law in Title 13. So this has to do with the sentencing statute that you have on the books already. So this is where we're asked. Yeah, I mean, it does helpful as Representative Coburn was saying. It sort of helps for understanding to, to, to know what's going on in both those sections. But this is the one specifically that, okay. that um, 
they were noting for this committee to look at, because this is a Title 13 criminal code sentencing issue. And in this case, see top of page seven, and, and you already, the, the two subdivisions one and two already, in other circumstances, provide the court uh, with authority for giving credit for time served or uh, other things related to um, conduct that the offender has been involved in. So this sort of adds to that list. And this is, all right, well, if you receive pre-adjudication treatment, and that makes sense if you think about it, because at that point, if it's before the adjudication, prior to, but that's what I mean by before, um, then the court, it's still before the court when the defendant comes um, up for sentencing or for the trial, and it's still uh, an open matter for the court to consider and decide whether or not the person's sentence should be reduced for this drug treatment that they had or this alcohol treatment. Whereas if it's post-adjudication, if it's after that's already happened and the person's already been sentenced, well, at that point it makes more sense for the commissioner to be the one who's um, uh, reducing their sentence when it's appropriate. So that's why you were just noticing um, that in, the, in page four, the post-adjudication stuff stays with the commissioner. That stays with what, what they do. Because at that point, they have authority over the person. They are, have the ability to reduce their sentence. Because I guess, according to uh, Commissioner and some other folks in DOC, that does happen sometimes. E even after adjudication, the person will go to inpatient treatment um, facilities. And um, they want to make sure that uh, you got a one for one. Because remember what I said about good time. Good time isn't one for one. Mm -hmm. It's five days per month. So this allow this makes sure that the person would get, if you were in for two weeks, then you could get 14 days, mm -hmm. even if it was only in one month. Um, but you see that second, or if you look at that provision, the second sentence, this is a, they didn't want there to be double dipping in a sense. So that, well, in other words, you don't, while well, the person's in substance abuse treatment, they're not going to get good time for that same period of time. In other words, you can get your 14 days off, but that 14 days won't count as a period of time during which you can also get that other five days off for, for good time. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, so right now, you were saying the commissioner, so Here's what I'm struggling with. I know that we have people who can finish serving their minimum sentence at Lund, for example, and get treatment hmm. as part of, so would, it, yeah, so how is that situation, I mean, I don't think people, well, they're finishing their sentence, they're not getting good time. Maybe they're just allowed to complete the remainder of their sentence. Right. At, at and we're not, I'm sure we're not the only program. Right, right. So there must be other treatment programs where that happens. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I see Marshall May, I see his arm being raised so over there. But. That's one type of furlough. Um, so the commissioner can give somebody furlough in order to, the same way that we. Um, you know, typically people are programmed within a DOC facility in the period leading up to their release. But if there's, uh, you know, if there's some kind of treatment that's better done in an inpatient facility somewhere, the commissioner can furlough them to that facility. It's just like a medical furlough or, you know, this account, but I can't even name all the kinds of furlough we have at this point. There's a million kinds. I, I think you said 28. I'm 28 thinking back now. I don't, I don't <laughs> have that. But that's one of the kinds of furlough is to, so they're, in that situation, they're still actually technically in the custody right, of right, the commissioner. Right. Um, serving their sentence. Serving their sentence right. in, in one. So again, back to okay. what we're looking at. Yeah, I just want to make sure how. So this is, they've been sentenced, but they haven't been um, put in, correct? They're, they're not incarcerated yet. Well, for the for the pre adjudication group, uh, they might not have been sentenced yet. Sometimes okay. people go to they'll go to a treatment program before sure. in order to sort of show, show the judge exactly that right. exactly. Right. Um, but uh, but for um, if they were completing their sentence in the situation you described, and there's no and the, and they never come back in, well then this wouldn't right. apply to them. But, but if you had to, if they were going out for treatment while they were in sentence and they did come back, 
what this is saying, and this is on page four, this is saying that, let's say they went out for two weeks. I'm just throwing a number out there. Um, then, um, and they come back and they had a month left on their sentence. Well, that, according to this, would, they would have only two weeks left because, because that two weeks, weeks would right. count. Um, so, so one, cons not concern, but it says when, while a person is in a residential substance abuse treatment. So Barbara, I'm sorry, um, that's not. That's not our committee. Can, we can understand it, but, um, but we're specifically okay. correct looking at section. Yeah, but I think it uses four. the same language. Right. Let me uh, just right. double check. Right. I might All be right. wrong on that. I want to check on it's it. Slightly different. Right, so that was page four. Pre-education treatment and an inpatient setting. Let's just see if it uses that same language. I think it does, but I want to double check on that. Pre-education treatment, inpatient setting for some. Yeah, so that part is the same, right? Um, so your concern is about the inpatient, but just the wording, because okay. again, um, dual diagnosis and dual treatment is best practice, and so there are lots of programs that provide, for example, like Lund is an outpatient substance abuse program, not a residential one. Mm -hmm. And so it wouldn't, I don't know why it's just defined as residential substance abuse as opposed to mental health slash substance abuse or treat, again, depending on what the treatment is. I don't know if that's just talking about the ADAP certification and that might exclude programs that they didn't mean to exclude yeah I don't I don't know I got that language from uh, our healthcare team so they said that's used for that specific uh, universe of folks um, right. but as far as whether it might unintentionally exclude somebody else or whether you might want to include others other than that it has to be inpatient right um, leave that point aside right um, I don't know, you know. Right, because uh, like the retreat has yeah. a bunch of different programs, summer stuff. So again, it might be dealing with the underlying substance abuse issue as a secondary diagnosis and trying to deal with the mental health diagnosis first in order to be successful with substance abuse treatment, which is pretty common. Right. So I don't know if that, they want that kind of input or not. Right. Yeah, I have, I mean, I think just echoing Tom, Tom's question and a little of Barbara's question, I, I, and maybe there's a very good reason for it, but I just, I, on first glance, I'm wondering why it would only be limiting to inpatient treatment. So, and I think Barbara's question is a good one too, like for people who are, have co-occurring disorders or dual diagnosis. I can speak to the inpatient one. The inpatient one is because the idea here is that you get credit, you know, that's what's similar to being incarcerated. Outpatient treatment is not, not the same thing. Not to say that you couldn't make that policy choice, but that's why the, the parallel is drawn. So, Eric, um, so somebody in the good time, somebody uh, crew sometime, doesn't matter how much, comes off the uh, minimum, mm -hmm. also comes off the maximum. Right. So uh, they reach their minimum a little sooner. Yep. So after you reach that minimum, do, does the, uh, every 30 days, are you still collecting another five days heading toward your maximum? Yep. If you stay in, sure. Definitely. Yep. So just going back to what uh, Salim was saying, there's a big difference besides being inside the gate than outside of the gate. That's why it's written differently, I would think. That's true. Right? I mean, I mean that's you why have it's a lot more freedom outside. You still got to obey some laws, but you hold it. Right. And I could try to get somebody from the corrections, but, but what I'm hearing is that they're trying to, again, on the sentencing side, look at somebody who has participated in inpatient treatment. So can I just say yeah. one more thing? So on uh, on the first page on 14, 
right? If the um, the commissioner, the chief superior, uh, and everybody, Pepper probably, and Marshall, and everybody, if that if if this bill is written the way they want it, what would be the problem? Why wouldn't we why wouldn't we give our okay to it? Sorry, I guess I was supposed to be looking at you. No, no, actually you were <laughs> you were right to look at the, the other folks, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're just I mean, I mean we haven't heard all, all that testimony. We're looking at one particular section here that deals with sentencing. Um, I get that part. Yeah. But so these guys that wanted all this stuff done, they haven't seen this yet. The, the, they haven't looked at this bill yet as written. No, they have. But in a different committee. Different it's, committee. It's, a, the reason it's over in House Corrections and Institutions. So this is a bill that they're working on. I think they're really yeah, there's a couple of a uh, couple of last minute sort of language changes, and then the, the other uh, the, uh, the the other issue that they're talking about is applicability. Does it apply going forward or to offenders who are sentenced right now? That's sort of the last conceptual issue. Other than that, there's a couple of little language pieces, and they're pretty close, I think. So I would love to figure out a way how we can jurisdictionally get our consent for on that going forward. Right. I mean, because presumably the concept is that when these individuals were sentenced, when there wasn't good time, the judge right. took this into account and right. gave them a shorter sentence. That's the theory, is what I understand. That, and um, I think the other thing they talked about was that there's a victim notice issue there, that yeah, victims at the time, sure, sure. you know, if now the sentences are reduced when a time that wasn't permitted in law before, that, that might be a concern for victims. Um, I assume they can hear from the victims. Yep. Oh, yes. Although, yes. Um, this very last point, I think, uh, because it's still in the discussion stage, I don't know that they've discussed that with victims yet. Well, I will personally. I guess we can figure out how to. Well, that is the way. Committee. The way it's written now is exactly as you say, or uh, which is right there. You see that it's on page four, line 19 and 20. So right now, it's available only to offender sentence on or after. It's not going forward. It is going forward, right. Not only going forward. No, only going forward. I want it to go to whoever is already incarcerated. Oh, I see. Yeah, I disagree with that. Gotcha. I misunderstood. I thought you said the exact opposite. <laughs> but now I'm clear. <laughs> no, or I need, or I need to listen. I need to listen better, one or the other. <laughs> um, so does, does this apply to only people who are the uh, good time, does it only apply to people who are incarcerated? No. It applies to people who are under the custody of the commissioner. Right. And that could be, uh, where is that language? Uh, the, no, that's what I thought. Because that even brings up more of an issue to me uh, for somebody who does outpatient treatment. Mm -hmm. Because if not everybody... Does, if everybody was getting incarcerated and somebody went to residential, I understand that being, uh, in a sense, locked up for locked up. And but if if it applies to people who are, in, I don't know the right terms, that basically uh, convicted and uh, are on parole and, and out on the street, and, and if they go to treatment, they, they get no credit for it. So not that, not that. It's your job to cure that. But it's right, just, right. It's just my concern. It's, it's not, it, to me, it's not treating people, uh, people. Right, I hear you. But, but just so you know who it applies to, that's on in subsection B line there. So it's all sentenced offenders, including furloughed offenders. And then there's a list of exclusions, not available if you're on probation or parole. If you already, that highlighted language there means you already get good time under the work camp statute, or if you get life without parole. Oh, you, you, you were next. I was, and uh, so, um, Maxine's stepped out, but maybe one of the two of you can answer this question. So are we being asked to, are we, you can, are we being asked to vote on this or just give feedback? I think it's feedback because it's not formally in there. Okay. So there's nothing to vote on yeah. at the moment. So. I mean, my, I certainly would support this, and I think my feedback is that 
I have some of the quite the same questions that Tom and Barbara have been raising, particularly knowing that um, in my treatment <coughs> communities and discussions that are happening around the state, there's there's definitely questions at times are around the efficacy of inpatient settings compared to outpatient settings. And so I, I just worry that I definitely get the like locked up to locked up yep. kind of, but it, I mean, it is and it isn't, right? But I, I worry, I, there's just a little worry that I have that we're incentivizing a treatment setting that might not work as well for a number of people. So, um, yeah, so um, Representatives um, Evans and Shaw are going to come in a few minutes and, oh, great. and tell us what, what they were thinking. Okay. And, and that might okay. Yeah. <laughs> help us. Uh, and I was just asking, we're not, we're not like voting on this, we're just sort of giving up. So, like, are these two guys in favor of this? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, hello there. We got draft 6.1. <laughs> 6.1. <laughs> <There. laughs> <Six point one. laughs> <laughs> That's Molly, Molly looking it's good to see her. <laughs> they told us to come over and make sure we do the same thing. Oh, oh, no. I said, I don't understand a word of this. <laughs> Who wrote this stuff? <laughs> you need backup? <laughs> uh, you guys came in just in time. Well, we will call. Here, I'll let you guys. I don't want it in a hot seat. Jesus. Grab all the chair. I've got my buddy with me. Oh, does this mean that we should get the cross in the chair? Behind you, Alex. Get another chair. Yeah. We got another draft coming. Yeah. This? Yeah. 7.1. 7.6, I think. Oh, these are all words. No. Oh. Of this particular section? No, I don't know. What section are you on? The pre or the post? Great. So our, so we may take that out, right? So yeah. my understanding is that that you would like us to look at section four. Yes, that's your post adjudication. There's two pieces here. One on page four, which is um, line five. Section line five deals with. Post adjudication, it's in Title 28. It only pertains to corrections. It only pertains to those folks who are sentenced and in a correctional facility. Well, not just in a correctional yeah, offender. So they would allow. They would be getting good time, day for day, and it's a DOC process. If you look on page seven, section four. Now, as you said, that's for people who are convicted? Post adjudication is convicted. That's your world, not us. I'm still learning. <laughs> Pre adjudication is they have a charge. Okay, okay, they have not been sentenced. So, this section four is in Title 13. So, it does not pertain to corrections, it pertains to sentencing in the judiciary. So if a defendant, it's not going to be offender, because offender is people under the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. So we're correcting that to a defendant, which is someone who's been charged. If pre-adjudication, they are in treatment subsequent to the charge that's being filed, then when the sentencing is done, the judge can take into consideration the reduction of day for day in their sentence. That's the intent to this section. And that's that's what you would like us to Ah, yes. yes. <laughs> Unless, you, unless you got questions about good time, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Questions. People are confused. <laughs> so I think some of us had questions about, and I, I sort of understand it conceptually, but just like more from a public health 
viewpoint, I think some of us had questions about why limit it only to inpatient treatment. It came from the Defender General. This request came from the Defender General, and the request came, it was Matt Valerio who testified in our committee, and the a testimony he gave was that this would provide incentive for folks to get into treatment if they could get good time. And then when we started looking at it, we said, wait a minute, the judge doesn't give out good time as corrections. So that's why we put the pre-adjudication into sentencing because that's incorporated right now in terms of their sentence that if before their sentence they're involved in treatment, then that's taken into consideration when the judge sentences them. And we're saying it would be day for day, that if they're participating in a treatment, inpatient treatment, whatever, I'm going to put on my glasses, because we've had so many reiterations of this inpatient setting that is subsequent to the charge that's being filed for them against them, then when the judge sentenced, if they were there for 30 days, an inpatient, then 30 days will be taken off that sentence. So uh, my feedback, and you can take it or leave it, I mean, I certainly support that concept, and I would love to see it expanded to not just inpatient treatment, but outpatient treatment, because I think... It's not our call. I mean, that's up to you folks. I mean, we're, we're doing the language as the Defender General recommended to us. Did you have any discussion at all on the outpatient? No. No. It was at a recommendation from the Defender General to encourage folks to get into inpatient treatment, substance abuse treatment. And just, I have a question. At various times there's been waiting lists to get into inpatient treatment. So suppose someone did want, is that still a barrier or is that kind of old news? We're not, we didn't get into that detail. This was a recommendation from the Defender General, so you might want to ask the Defender General and Judge Pearson. So I could speak, to that. <laughs> I could speak to that briefly if it's appropriate at this point. Um, so, well, let's see if there's anything else for Mr. Pearson. Okay. Did you want to say something? No, I'm good. Oh, I'll let him know. You're in the little chair. <laughs> That's why we wanted you folks to take a look at this because originally this language was under Title 28, which dealt with good time. Well, the court does not, it does not award good time. Only if you're incarcerated and you're under the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections and you have already been sentenced, detainees don't get good time. So it was pre and post adjudication, the original language, and now we have split it where post adjudication is under DOC for good time, pre adjudication is in Title 13 so that if there is inpatient treatment, the judge takes that into consideration when placing the sentence, that it's a day for day off that sentence. So if the person was in, in an inpatient treatment for 30 days, the judge takes that into consideration under this language. If the sentence was 12 months, he'd take a month off because he's already served. So it would only be 11 months. No, day for day. That's a different world. Unless you're... Potentially, you're serving. So we heard earlier today. Speak up. No. Said, okay. We heard earlier this <laughs> afternoon uh, from Judge Gerson. I think uh, you might be interested in hearing what he has to say. What he has to say, but uh, this is. We heard that this is current practice from the judiciary now, but they uh, are putting people into and giving them credit for time uh, served uh, prior to being incarcerated. It's where this differs from what they're doing now is, is now is that you get good time for that, you get day for day for that, um, and that is, is, is a little different. So I think your judge could also help you shed light on that. So this is a slightly different question. Uh, it kind of comes into the sentencing commission work that has been working on and such, that, that uh, <clears throat> we do have a number of statutes that 
for offenses that have minimum sentences mm -hmm. by statute. Uh, is good time something mm -hmm. that can be calculated to reduce the minimum sentence set by statute? They're for both minimum and maximum. What, whether it's, but in the way, I mean, I understand that a, the, a judge can set a minimum and maximum, but this is a statutory minimum, so it's essentially notwithstanding these other provisions that say for this crime you have to be in for at least three years. Well, that's, that's why we brought this to you in terms of the pre-adjudication, because that's your world. The post-adjudication where you're incarcerated is our world, so we understand that better. But our understanding from what also from the judge and what Butch said that this is current practice right now for sentencing. And if you look at the language, would earn a reduction of one day in the offender's minimum and maximum sentence for each day that the offender receives the inpatient treatment. So if that's happening right now, how is that being played out? with our statutory minimum and maximum requirements. I don't have an answer to that. I'm sure the judge or folks who are used to working in the criminal justice judiciary system will. It's just a, I guess it's a question of just if there needs to be a notwithstanding. That might even be a question for Eric. I don't know. Uh, for the record, Brian Griggs, Chief Superior Judge. Um, at, at present, someone comes in for sentencing, if they have been in a treatment program, um, we give them credit, the phrase is credit for time served. Um, so it, it, in that sense, we're doing this, but we don't necessarily take it off the minimum or, and maximum. We let the department do the calculation. In other words, someone will come in, if they've been in a treatment program for 30 days, we'll give them a sentence of whatever it is, six months to a year, credit for time served and I believe the way the department calculates that is it's probably 30 days off the minimum. Uh, so in that sense I was wrong that we, I don't believe that it comes off the maximum at this point but we do give pre-adjudication credit for treatment <coughs> at, the, at the present. So even if the statute says you have to serve at least three years the point is you're saying you're giving credit for time served so you have you'll still end up serving three years essentially but you will already have served 30 days. Yes. Yeah. So can I ask a question of that, too? <laughs> Setting this aside, but if the person decided there was bail, and the person decided not to make bail, and they were a detainee, mm -hmm. and they stayed there until they were adjudicated, mm -hmm. and they were there as a detainee for 30 days, those days, each day, counts towards yes. their sentence. So we, that's why we look at treatment right now as a, essentially the same as if you were detained. You're getting credit for that time that you're in treatment. Okay, so it would be the same scenario where the sentence would be X amount, but then DOC would calculate that right. and say, well, there's 30 days automatically taken off because as a detainee, each yeah. day counted towards those t the time served. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why people don't make bail quite often because they want those days to count towards their sentence. Barbara, then a little editorial, but that's true. <laughs> so I'm wondering if it's true. other types of treatment currently count. So um, I was saying many times people need mental health treatment or co-occurring treatment in order to successfully deal with <coughs> their addiction. So. I was saying one, for example, is not an inpatient residential substance abuse treatment program. And people are currently going there as part of their MIN, um, or they can, but it's the way the amendment is written now, it may exclude other mental health programs too. So I guess I was wondering, you know, what how treatment was being defined. And to Selena's point, if someone's in intensive, they could be in intensive outpatient treatment, you know, are they getting credit? I, I would say that they're not getting credit for intensive outpatient treatment because the way we're looking at treatment in the residential setting is it, it's residential. <laughs> it's residential. I mean, right, okay. You, yeah. I, I don't want to say you're confined there, but you know, you're right. You, okay. As long as you're there participating in the program, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're Right. You're restricted. 
right. and there are liberty restrictions. Yes, you're doing it voluntarily, right? But so that's why we, we um, analogize it to being right. detained for those 30 right. days. We'd rather have them in treatment, but get them get them credit for that time, and so we can't really do it on an outpatient basis, right? Because I don't know how you calculate. Yeah, and what about months, the right. mental health versus? You know, that's interesting. It depends. I'm not. <coughs> I'm not aware of any facility for something that was strictly for mental health treatment unless they're subject to a civil process. Or, for example, again, and maybe one is an anomaly, but people are getting residential mental health treatment and outpatient substance abuse treatment because how the funding and mechanism works, but there may be other programs. Brattleboro <laughs> Retreat has a number of programs. Some of so people are getting treated for co-occurring disorder, but if they're not addressing the underlying issue, sometimes that is an issue. So let me answer it two ways. One, this limits the substance abuse treatment. The idea that certain attorney could make the sentencing judge if they describe right, the programs in such a way that they may be. And my other concern is if it's after, I mean, I'd want to hear from folks in the treatment world about if people are using it to leverage getting out early. Talking about post-adjudication. Post-adjudication. So, two things that I guess I would say, first of all, you're, you're talking about a very, 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 very sure. small population. Right. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't even aware that the department offered that. You're probably, and they can speak to it better than I can, probably looking at a population that is close to their release date. Um, and it, it's just a different situation than the pre-adjudication. Right. Pre because as somebody said, like a lot of times there aren't openings. So if, if you're if an if a if a program is looking at who to take, there they may be taking somebody who they think it's going to be more successful as the limited resources and sometimes when people are seeking it because their attorney recommended they do it before their court date or something people aren't as into it all the time you know so it's, it's I guess, a whole different setting yeah, okay. because they're in it, they're incarcerated right um, they're not going to have Obviously, the same opportunities sure. and the whole issue of right. the waiting list that you asked okay. it, it would be different. Yes, I mean, if the person is, if the department is seriously considering down? this person as an appropriate eligible for uh, residential treatment, first of all, it's a clinical decision. It's, right. it's not a right. strictly a DOC decision. That, okay, it's, that's it's a yeah. clinical yeah. decision. Yeah. And yeah. if they were going to set that up, they would be in touch with a residential facility to make sure if they're going to release it. So it would be a somewhat lengthy process. But the correction is being taken. So if I can if I can interrupt, we're yeah. looking at the version as it came over from the Senate. And the Senate included inpatient setting for substance use disorder. So that was in the Senate bill as it came over to us. So we didn't change that piece, that part of the language. Margaret, do you want to address some of Sure. Just so um, I'll speak to a couple of issues that might clarify some of this. Um, so our recommend, the, the reason we recommended this is simply to codify what's current law. Um, current law is that you get credit. And the, and the law comes out of a, state, a case called State v. McPhee, where um, someone was put into inpatient residential substance abuse treatment uh, during the period leading up to their trial. And the question was, do they get credit for time served the same as they would if they had been held in jail for the period leading up to their trial? And the Supreme Court said, yeah, sure, they should get the credit for that because <coughs> they are essentially confined into a residential treatment setting. And if they were out of that setting, then they wouldn't get the treatment, then they wouldn't get the, um, the credit. And we were just simply looking to codify that because it's being, and to codify it in a way that it, that I think expands McPhee just slightly and clarifies practice because there had been inconsistent practice around one question, which was what it, some judges were giving credit <coughs> only when the residential treatment was court ordered, where it was a condition of release. 
Some judges were giving the credit even when the treatment was voluntary. Um, and our goal was to make that consistent and to make it so that you got the credit whether you were court ordered or voluntary because that had led to some absurd situations where, for example, judges who had a defendant in front of them who had already, you know, who shows up for their, let's say, a DUI and says, you know, at their, um, at their bail review hearing or their conditions of release hearing, says, Your Honor, I'm already accepted into a residential substance abuse program. I'm heading there as soon as court is over. And the judge might not then order them to go to the program, which then <coughs> leads to them not getting credit for that, um, when in fact the reason why the judge didn't order them to do it was because they were doing it voluntarily in the first place. So our goal was simply to clarify and codify that existing law to make it clear that you get the treatment if you do, in, or you get the credit if you do inpatient treatment, whether it's court ordered or not, prior to um, prior to your conviction. The question of whether that should be expanded or not is more of a policy question, which we weren't trying to, to grapple with here in, in this. So we were just trying to codify existing law. And to answer the question of all the different kinds of treatment, it's absolutely not dependent on it being substance use. I've had people get the credit for uh, being in a retreat. I've had people get the credit for being at uh, the Spring Valley Ranch. I've had the people, I've had, I think I've had people get the credit for being at Lund. Um, so it's absolutely not dependent on the type of treatment. It's, it is dependent on the question that the treatment is inpatient rather than outpatient. Um, so, right, and I, and I agree that the way that this is written because it says substance use, I don't think that precludes anybody from getting the credit for non-substance use treatment. It's just not going to be spelled out in the statute. Instead, you just have to rely on state DVT, which is what we all do whenever we are trying to get our clients credit for inpatient treatment anyway, is we just point at the and say, you know, here's the, you know, you bring in a, a, a letter from your, from the doctor that says the person did, you know, 30 days of successful treatment at the retreat or whatever, and we point to the and we get the credit that way. So it's not, I don't think it precludes anybody from getting it. Um, it's possible that it could be clearer if we took the, we just said inpatient treatment and took substance abuse out of it. Uh, but I don't think it changes anybody's practice. Yeah. I think this question might be for Alice. I'm not sure since it's post adjudication. So, so there's, uh, there's some, Treatments that are a year long. Does, does that apply to or be inpatient? Yeah. Inpatient. Mm -hmm. Would that be post or pre? Which post. one are you talking? Post uh, or pre? However, they could potentially get the credit for it. <laughs> Chances are it be more pre adjudication than post, though I may look at DOC. We just had testimony from DOC about the post adjudication inpatient treatment which is more complicated for someone who is incarcerated with a sentence to get into uh, a clinical treatment um, facility where it's based on the clinical needs not so much your sentencing needs but your cl clinical needs and Monica I don't know if you can expand a little bit on what Kim Bushy was talking well, about if you'd well, like I, to, I'm not or get sure. Kim I want to here. answer a question, that, but, and, but I don't think I understand the question. Being asked, so. <laughs> well, like, I guess it would be pre. Uh, oh, well, pre doesn't pertain to that. Right. Pre pertains. So if somebody went to a, a year long uh, treatment pre adjudication, would they be able to get the credit for three months? That would be I, probably I, I the intent yes, of probably. this. Yeah. yeah. So, so if they're doing a uh, extended program uh, that goes past the time of their sentencing, and you know they, uh, because this this credit that that we're offering, if it's a year uh, long treatment program, you know let's let's say for example and they might have started the program before they went into 
uh, the facility and arrangements might have been made for them to continue, you know, the treatment while they're they're in custody. After their sentence? Yeah. After I, I, their I know, sentence. Yeah. You, you said it's difficult, but it's it's After possible. After their sentence. It's it's possible what I'm hearing. You know, right? You know, I mean if if a um, they start, then they're sentenced, and then they're in custody, but they're continuously in a program? Is that what I... I don't think that go, does that go that way? I, no, it, 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 if it's a... See, if it's not an inpatient program, you know, let, let's say, for example, uh, you know, the, the particular program requires three or four uh, sessions, you know, a, uh, a week. And uh, it's not so. So that wouldn't wouldn't meet wouldn't meet muster. Is what we're getting. At. Okay. I think really if you, what you're talking about, if somebody's going to an extended program mm -hmm. pre adjudication, yeah. pre sentencing. Mm -hmm. Probably what's going to happen is that the court was made aware of that and you would defer the, the, the sentencing of the okay. case to allow them to complete the program. And that's usually the way that works. And then if they're successful, the treatment of that time would then come into play? Sure. You get credit for it. But right. even more than that, if you get somebody that's out in the community, mm -hmm. first of all, if, right. if they're not incarcerated, mm -hmm. well, the chances of them being incarcerated are certainly diminished. Mm -hmm. And if they've spent a substantial amount of time in treatment, mm -hmm. it's not only you're going to get credit for it, but you'll get credit on disposition of the case, right. if someone's had serious okay. treatment and recovery, it's going to be reflected in what ultimately happens. And that, and that was the In other words, if somebody spends a year in a treatment program, mm -hmm. I think their chances of them going to jail is a lot less. Pretty wrong. But right. I can't speak for all mm -hmm. 32 judges. You know, they'd have to do something <laughs> really bizarre. So I don't know what your thoughts are on this. We wanted to make sure we weren't blindsiding you because this is not our world. Um, any suggest? I know one thing we just talked about in my committee on that section was we're using the term inpatient setting and resident and inpatient treatment and residential substance abuse treatment interchangeably. And the testimony we received from DOC was the terms mean different things. Inpatient and residential mean different things. So we need to be consistent. That's what we just heard. And specific. So I don't know if that would be inpatient throughout or residential throughout. But that's something we'll have to vet with Eric. You can ask him. Pardon? You can ask him. I'm going to ask Kim. Yeah, Kim's still on committee. So I don't know if you could answer. Is there a difference between inpatient and residential? No. Is there a different definition? I think it's the treatment world mm -hmm. may interpret mm -hmm. that differently. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. It's yeah. a surprise to all of us. We're not sure. Right. I mean, it may be a funding source difference or something. You know what I mean? Like a one contract may call something. Yeah. So we so need to vet there. that. Right. We need to vet that. Usually it's more if it's substance abuse treatment or something else, right. right, but not, right, right. unless so they're talking about hospital, per se. Which may, right, yeah, I think it's going to be reported in the bill. Yeah. Is hospital, right, right. It's still right. Yeah, yeah right. you're going to report the bill. Yeah, the dust okay. stuff, we corrected <laughs> the dust stuff. Yeah, no one. Oh, I just looking around here. Sounds like everybody's in favor of this in this room. Just we got to figure out the inpatient residential. So you'll see a change to this section to clarify it. Yep. That's the easy part. Thank you. Thank you. Alice. Keep them in line. Uh-uh, it's the other way around. <laughs> we walk well together. We protect each other's back. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Right, it was like moving, changing the word father to biological parent or something. Yeah, right, the yeah. It's like talk to DCF about right, right. something else. Wasn't here before, so. Yeah. So, by a show of hands, I'd like us to concur. So, no baby here? No. Yeah. So, I'd like to repeat All right, so basically, all members who are present. And, um, and are you okay having been the reporter today and saying that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Is that tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so Barbara will be reporting uh, youth offender. Right. Yeah. And um, I, you know, we have been hearing from some members, especially in Washington County, concern, and they keep coming, you know, in here, but really, um, this morning we heard from the James Pepper and, and DCF is, is really, um, again, I'm talking about 133, um, that this is, you know, the implementation is just starting, it's going to take, right. it's going to take a bit. Um, some of the questions about whether or not um, expanding it, limiting it, whatever, right. um, they're constantly being reviewed by, by the stakeholders, uh, but that, you know, for that one small piece, we're going back to prior law where the hearings, the public safety hearings were in public, but otherwise, right. the, but to, to start doing anything more could really undermine the entire program. Right. I don't think anybody wants that, and hopefully our state's attorneys will understand that, so. so. Okay. Any damage control, but I, so I, anyway, so we should, as a committee, should know that, and Barbara, you should know that, <coughs> That comes your way. I'm trying to prevent it from right, okay, coming thanks. your way. Or, right. Um, then it, you need to take a recess or something. Okay. All right. So, thank you. has done section by section. Does she? Yeah, for you. Um, okay. So. Did she send that? I got it. I'll see if you're copying. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I knew she said afternoon, but I didn't. Yeah. Any questions that that you have? Well, we actually have. <laughs> stakeholders in the room to help you for tomorrow? I, I mean, I had a chance to talk to DCF briefly and know that. So I got uh, that the presentation that, um, who did the presentation? Because I wasn't here. Maybe Karen or Leslie. Leslie, Leslie get it, right. Yeah. And like where, what, where, what came from. Because mm -hmm. most of it's from this, like the stakeholder group, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Everything but that one section about right. the public safety portion right. of the consideration hearing. It's so. from the stakeholder group. Yeah. Right. And you're all yeah. in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. And we did hear, um, Washington County State's Attorney had a whole bunch of recommendations, mm -hmm. but it's just... A little late. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, actually, I would say it's a little too early. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, in, the, in the process. Okay, um, all right. And so... All right, yeah, that's good that's to know. That's where we plugged in and we did. Our, our stakeholder group agreed to look at those recommendations and report back on them. So that's, they're not being dismissed or anything. Okay. They're being looked at by mm -hmm. the stakeholder group. That's good. Right. Okay, so I can say that. Meet, well, when we're not in session, I think every, almost every other week practically, and, and they have to report back to us in November. So, so it's not the end of the conversation. Right. It's not the end of the conversation. And I did get Brin's email, so thank you. Great, great. So, um, so I know I'm jumping around a bunch. So back to 54. So just, um, it's alive. In terms of process plan, we don't have a bill. And um, so we don't need to take a formal vote. Um, so I maybe a whole type of thing um, as to. Um, the rest for a memo or something. From you to clarify what that position is. So, 
so, so, right, so I think what I would do is I would do a memo saying, you know, following our, our recommendations, um, and uh, so we would not necessarily be taking, we would like to get more testimony from persons that they have, you know, interest or questions on um, what, you know, we, we end up hopefully recommending on an informal this package again, have a discussion. There's a, um, something that you want to speak to at the speaking with the, the no warrant is. Yeah. Um so I'm, I'm working, I'm going to work with Brent a little bit. This is uh, and Pepper. And um, we, we continue to try to uh, figure out a way that we can satisfy everybody, which is impossible, of course. But uh, with as far as having some sort of slide of testing and uh, also warrant. The people who want slide and testing, there are people who don't want a warrant. So uh, the, the concept, though, is, uh, and I've asked, uh, I got some additional information from Dr. Conti. Uh, a few states are, in fact, uh, using the evidentiary uh, oral fluids test. Uh, and it's not roadside. Not roadside. So did she send the research, though? Uh, I was gonna. I didn't ask her for that. I was, gonna, I was just, in fact, looking for the email exchange to ask her for that as well. Um, in any event, from what I've heard from the expert, is that 97.2 percent of um, rate of accuracy relative to blood test. Uh, so the the concept is that uh, for for the draw of uh, saliva. Let, let me just walk through it this way. I apologize. My brain is starting to shut down off early this week. So a person uh, pulls somebody over, observes the behavior, does the field sobriety tests, uh, decides to take the, uh, the, uh, the vehicle driver into the station. Uh, at that time, can ask, uh, can explain implied consent, and can ask for a swab of saliva. Uh, the person can decline, uh, but that will be used against the person, uh, just like for a breath test. So let's assume the person does agree to uh, provide that uh, sample. Uh, the sample will be taken, it goes, puts into some sort of vial that preserves it, and it gets labeled, and gets ready to be sent to the lab. At the end of a... Is it, is it just like a breath test? Uh, as far and as the implied consent, as far yeah, as if you, there, to me anyway, there, there's no comparison between the two tests, so it's, to me, it's nothing like the breath test. Can we let, can we let more information? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> it's, it's the concept of, of, of a refusal, and what a refusal will, uh, whether it can be used or not, is, is really the issue. Um, and I do understand they're completely different. Yeah. I do understand, but it's just the consequence of the refusal. Um, so, uh, and it be, presented as evidence. <clears throat> so uh, after a DRE uh, does the evaluation, at that time the DRE has a decision point. Uh, and that is whether to seek a warrant uh, to use the saliva sample to actually send it to the lab and actually be able to use that sample to detect whether there was a drug or not. Uh, or or can, uh, if they don't seek a warrant, the sample is destroyed. So the bottom line is that there's not a warrant requirement for the draw or the taking of the saliva, but if the, if the uh, law enforcement prosecutor wants to use the saliva information, uh, it has to, they would have to seek a warrant. And, and we can have Bryn uh, uh, explain uh, as far as warrant requirements, whether a warrant, uh, whether a warrant is required or not, depends on really two inquiries, is my understanding, from Brent. Uh, one is how intrusive uh, the, uh, the search is. Uh, a blood draw is considered very uh, intrusive. Uh, <coughs> saliva has not necessarily been found to be intrusive. The Can you clarify the, that? The second component, let me finish in that. But just think. like physically intrusive, I think. Is physically intrusive. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
the second component for looking at whether a warrant's requirement is whether it's intrusive as far as privacy and such. Uh, what is the information that is going to be used? Uh, whether it's uh, DNA or whatever the case is, uh, that's, and we can have Bryn explain this better than I can, because uh, you're getting it secondhand from Bryn through me, that the warrant requirement, again, has these two components. Uh, and, and we're essentially suggesting, well, this next draft that I'm working on <coughs> would have the warrant requirement for getting information for that privacy component of it, but not for actually getting the draw. And the reason for that is the saliva has, can, in fact, be a better test even than blood if you're a lot closer to the time of the incident or arrest because of the metabolizing of, of the various substances that might be tested. Uh, blood test happens much later and can be metabolized. So it gives you more accurate uh, whether there's presence of the, of the substance or not. So that's in a nutshell what that is. Yeah, no, I'm not confused. I'm so confused. But I'm here asking the feedback. Well, yeah, I'm giving you a heads up. I'm, I'm happy to hear. I don't know that we'll have to all give you feedback offline. The idea is that it does bring in, uh, for purposes of law enforcement, what they, from what I understand from, from Pepper and others, uh, including the governor. Uh, is as close to the incident as possible, having um, fluid uh, drawn. Uh, you're not going to draw at the roadside. That you know, it's a different test that's there. We have the trigger for that. That's completely separate. It's fluid that is right now being used in a number of states uh, for evidentiary tests uh, that can be sent to, to the lab for analysis or destroyed if the DRE doesn't get a so again, we need backup evidence because it's that sort of flies in the face of what I've read and I can't find. And where it's used in other states, in some cases they, um, it depends on the, if the state is a per se state or not because again, that, that's the same thing when we say for other countries. If we are gonna arrest someone for cocaine because it doesn't matter when they used Absolutely, but to make the generalization that it's closer to the time so it's going to be more accurate, I want to see the scientific evidence, like I want the backup. I, because there are so many studies, some of them are again by the manufacturers. I can't find a lot about lab safety versus roadside safety. I will look for that, but it would be great to get that data. So I would guess, uh, you said with the saliva being sewer, and, uh, so what exactly, what evidence you're actually getting? To me, you're not getting any evidence. You said it's you're closer to the time. You're getting the, the, the presence of different metabolites. Not, just, uh, just, uh, let's just talk about cannabis. Yeah, you uh, THC, um, study that in fact, that Barbara gave me talks about how uh, it metabolizes and how a blood draw, though uh, the gold standard generally, a big problem is how many hours after uh, the incident uh, we actually can draw blood. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mean, it talks specifically about uh, even if the driver had smoked the cannabis, let me see where this is. Even if the driver had smoked the cannabis one minute before the traffic stop, the driver's blood plasma THC level would have fallen 80 to 90 percent in the first hour after ingestion. I mean, it's explaining how quickly it metabolizes, even more so after two and a half hours. So, what difference do levels make when all we're doing this testing process? Well, whether you're going to find the presence at all. So, if it goes to zero, potentially. With and even more so after two or after two and a half hours. Yeah. It's showing figure one. Because everything we've heard and talked about is that it stays in your system for a long time. Days, uh, often, two yes, weeks. but I don't think that's the case for that's that's for uh, a user who uses it a 
Like, whose study is that? Oh, okay. I got it right here. Okay. So, no, if we're saying the, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm just questioning why we would treat the blood and saliva evidentiary tests kind of apples to oranges in, in, in the instance of a warrant requirement. Oh, because in what sense? I'm not sure. Because I think we're saying we would still require a warrant for a blood evidentiary test, but you're saying we wouldn't require a warrant for the draw only to then have it be admissible as evidence for a saliva test? You would need the warrant if you're actually going to have it tested. If you, we, we can write it so you, can have, you have to have a warrant before you send it to the lab. But that's it's, different from blood, right? It is, it is different than, than so blood. Why? Um, if we're hearing that the same, that blood has the same kind of time sensitivity. True. And that's why we're trying to find something that allows them to have the fluids as close as possible. And you can't do that for blood. Because even to draw blood, you have to have a warrant. I'm, I'm suggesting right. that, that there's not any kind of law that, as I understand, uh, there's a good argument. I don't believe that there's any established warrant requirement for drawing or for getting slime from somebody to look as well. And there may be some cases here and there. Uh, I think it's, an, uh, it's, it's not a settled question like, like for blood draw. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're allowing the draw of the slide with a swab, but you're providing that protection of the information by requiring the warrant for actually using it, it's trying to Mm -hmm. the baby. Yeah, no, I, I, I can get that. Just, I, you know, Work good? I'm not totally feeling that. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to make the difference there, but we're, we're going to talk about this more tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we have some language Because the way, the way it is now, the way it is. Yeah, the way, I mean, it, so right now, somebody could, or the law enforcement officer, when they get back to the station, can ask for consent to draw. They can do that for blood, frankly. Right. You know, we're passing the hospital, right. I'll ask you for your consent, we'll stop in there. Uh, but they can ask for consent, and uh, there's really not that much of a motivation for somebody to consent to that. Right? But let's try to take the breath test. You ask for consent for the breath test, the evidentiary breath test, back uh -huh. the back parents. Uh, if you decline, that can be introduced as evidence against you that you decline. Um, <clears throat> but you can't, from my understanding, you can't do that for a blood test. If you if you ask for uh, consent for a blood test and you decline, nothing happens uh, un un until you get the warrant. Once you get the warrant, and if you then decline after you've gotten the warrant, then right. you can ask for it. Um, so it's trying to split this between the breath test and yes. blood test as yeah. well. Because I mean, it is a little bit different animal. It's not as intrusive yeah. as a blood test. But uh, if we're trying to protect our civil liberties part of this as far as any kind of use of that, the information that's contained in the food, that's what that's trying to get. I don't know why. It's just, I don't think it's trying to get the idea of protection. Is it I hear today that council Requested before we do the blood draw? Should there be yeah. something in there about access to council controllers? Yeah, I'm trying to set it up as close to the Was that already good? Is that introduced to the whole other player? I don't know. I mean, if there's. I'm going to call the board. I can ask. What are they going to say? I think that it would be implied because I think. <laughs> When I mean, it would be a good thing to clarify, but when you, you make the defendant or the operator aware of their opportunity to talk to an attorney, and you have to provide them with kind of a test to see if I remember it. You have to, they have 30 minutes um, to talk to an attorney, and then you have to make multiple attempts to contact an attorney, but the timer starts after that first attempt to call an attorney. 
to avoid the scenario where you're spending three or four hours trying to find an on-call attorney. I mean, that never really happens. Usually the defense attorneys pick up the first time, um, but the person has half an hour to, up to half an hour, they usually take 15 minutes um, to talk to an attorney before deciding whether or not to submit to an evidentiary test, whether it's breath or what. And this would happen at two o'clock in the morning? Oh, or four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You would call your own attorney? No, so, so you call him. You call, so each, yeah, yeah. You call, There, the, the state has on-call public defenders 24 hours a day for cases like this. Um, what about but those the, of us that don't use a public defender? You can also, you're also able to call your own attorney. Mm -hmm. it's, it's at 4 o'clock in the morning, he probably would just say, you're going to jail. Well, <laughs> perhaps you should find a new lawyer. Again, buddy, see what happens. <laughs> Yeah. That's what. That's why you should call the public defenders. We're up at two in the morning. Yes. Okay. 